I began to move in a rational manner. All of a sudden, I wanted to live. I felt a boldness sweep over me. I felt a calmness sweep over me. And the moment that that calmness and that peace settled upon me, my mind practically became a computer. The Word of God began sweeping through my mind, Scripture after Scripture after Scripture, almost like an IBM machine with the cards going through them so fast. Portions of Scripture, I will never leave you or forsake you. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the God that will deliver you. Scriptures I had learned as a boy in Sunday school, scriptures I had learned as a man, some scriptures I didn't even know I knew were flashing through my mind. And all of a sudden, portions of scripture from Isaiah 43, 1 through 3 became so real. The second verse says this, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. Now listen to this. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither will the flame kindle upon thee. And I listened and I heard it the second time. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither will the flame kindle upon thee. I was surrounded by fire and circumstances said I would burn. But God's word said I wouldn't burn. And I knew I wouldn't burn because God's word said so. And if it said so, that should be enough. God means what he says. If he says that you will not burn, you won't burn. There's no double meaning there. God means what he says. Take take his word at face value. I didn't know whether or not I would live or die. I assumed yet I would die. I knew of no way out of that furnace of fire. But I knew I wouldn't burn because God said so. I began doing something at that moment that I had never done before in all of my Christian experience. I began yelling and screaming at God. I never yelled at God before. I've always been the type that's believed in quiet meditation before the Lord. I still do. I think quiet times in God's presence are precious times. But I'm not the same old man I was two and a half years ago. And I don't even want to be. And I can assure you that if circumstances require audible prayer, this old boy will pray out loud, and if people don't like it, they can lump it. I don't care. I've come to the conclusion as a result of this experience in my life that my walk to heaven is between God and me. No one else has anything to do with it. It's up to me to pray to God in a way I know I'm reaching Him. It's up to me to sing to God and to praise Him in a way I know I'm reaching Him. And if that doesn't meet with the approval of those round about me, then I'm sorry. But I'm not in this seeking the approval of those round about me. I share this because I love my Father. I share this to glorify my God, who said he would be a very present help in the time of trouble, not seeking the approval of man. I began yelling at God. Circumstances said I would burn. God's words said I wouldn't. I began screaming, and I said, Father, in the name of Jesus, I stand upon the word. I stand upon the word, Father. I stand upon the word. I stand upon the word, Father. I stand upon the word. I stand upon the word. I stand upon the word. Over and over. I must have said it a thousand times as I fought my way through those flames. I stand upon the word. I stand upon the word. I stand upon the word, Father. I stand upon the word. I stand upon the word. It was all that I had, but oh, it was enough. Hallelujah. The word of God became my life. I know now what they mean when they say the living Bible. It becomes our life. And let me say this at this moment. In order for us to stand upon the Word of God at a moment like that, we must know what the Word of God says. There's no time then to get out your Bible and start thumbing through the pages and say, what page is it on? It doesn't work that way. My Bible was in a briefcase under the seat in front of me burning. I couldn't get it out to read it. I'm not saying that you have to memorize the Bible, but I am saying that you must have exposure to the Word of God. If you expect God through His Holy Spirit to reveal His Word to you in your moments of despair, you have to know what God's Word says. They tell me that there are approximately 70,000 promises in the Holy Bible from God to His people. It behooves us to have a percentage of that 70,000 down here on a permanent basis. And if we'll do that, then God through His Holy Spirit will reveal His Word to us and His Word will become our life. Time's almost gone. I'm not even out of the airplane. I'll have to do some talking, won't I? I'll talk fast. 
All of a sudden, there was a tremendous object coming towards me very fast through the air, and I knew I was going to be hit. There was no place to duck to get out of its way. I just knew it was going to hit me. I had presence of mind enough to know that if that thing hit me, it would pin me down. It was that large. It looked very large. It looked very hot. It was impossible to identify objects because the lights were out. The only lights we had were flames. Uh, you just couldn't identify what was happening. I believe it was part of the landing gear of the other plane because I was only eight rows back from where that landing gear came cutting through. But it was very, very large. It looked very, very hot. I knew I was going to be hit. The only thing I could do is to put my hands up in front of me like this to shield myself from the object that kept coming towards me. All of a sudden it hit me. It threw me back violently. I found myself beginning to respond to that thing with a strength that I didn't know was there. And as I shoved that object with every ounce of strength that I could muster, I found myself screaming loudly, In the name of Jesus! And I don't know what happened to that thing. I never saw it again. <laughs> I don't even know what it was, but it didn't pin me down. Now, two and a half years later, I'm of the firm opinion that God allowed that object to come towards me because it caused me to look up. Up to that time, I hadn't looked up. I'd been so engrossed with everything going on around me, I hadn't looked up. But as I looked up at that object, I spotted a hole in the roof. There had been an explosion right above my head. I could see the sky. I knew there was a way out if I could get up there. Ceilings in 747s are very, very high. I remember going through the hole. I remember seeing the hole. I have no recollection of how I got up to that hole. I call that my mini rapture. I just don't remember going up, that's all. But this God we're talking about tonight isn't going to show us a way out if he doesn't intend to take us through it. He just doesn't do things that way. I have no problem now with the message of the rapture. I have no problem now with the message of the resurrection. My Bible tells me that one of these days in the twinkling of an eye, I'll be caught away to be with him forevermore. And if he's going to do all of that, he had no problem with that ten feet that I needed some help with that day. I remember going through the hole, and as I went through the hole, I was still saying, I stand upon the word, I stand upon the word. I went out into space, the 747 is as high as a three-story building, you're way up there. I, I, I landed on the wing, the wing was covered with fuel, it was slippery like ice, it was difficult to maintain any kind of balance. On the ground to my right, there were about eight people, some were unconscious, others were jumping out of the plane and landing on them and killing them. I knew if I jumped there, I would kill people as well. I turned to work my way up the wing. The engines were still going, fire raging in each engine. I knew if I jumped too closely to the engine, I could be sucked in by the engine and killed. I knew the wing was still full of fuel. It, explosions were still occurring. It would be just a matter of seconds before the whole thing would go. You don't linger. You take off into space, any space. They say I jumped 30 to 35 feet. I don't know. It was a long ways down before I touched bottom. But the moment that my feet touched the grass, I knew in that instant what God had done. Seconds before, I watched everyone around me burn to death and die. I was bleeding. I was cut badly. The bones in my left foot were practically all broken and shattered. I was injured. But I knew in that instant that God had kept his word. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither will the flame kindle upon thee. No burns of any kind. I still have my clothing hanging in my closet at home. And every once in a while, I get it out and I look at it. This can never become a commonplace thing with me. It must always be a very holy, 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 holy moment as I realize that God is still in the miracle working business in the 20th century. I began working my way across the field, praising God, crying forth hosannas as I shared with you in this Time magazine picture. I got about 50 feet away. I fell. I looked back to see what I could see. There were two more explosions that took our plane in its entirety. The whole thing was gone. About 150 yards down the runway, I could see the KLM exploding severely. Uh, I still didn't know we'd been hit by that plane. I thought that our explosion had triggered other explosions since we were so close together. 250 people on that plane. Everyone died. No one lived. On our plane, there were 418 people, including the crew. Everyone died except 70. Today, there are only 60 of us still living. Ten have died since the crash as a result of injuries in the crash. A number of the 60 are still having skin grafts. A number of them have lost their minds. At this moment, I praise God for a third miracle, the miracle of a, a, a sane mind, that I can stand here tonight and coherently share this experience with you in a way that will cause you to reach out to God with faith for your own needs in your life, 
to me is just as much of a miracle as not being burned in the fire.